Are we on? Yeah. We're recording. Well, as Ron used to say when we would listen to his many lectures, today is Thursday, Friday. Friday, I was a, a day in the past. You see, I want to get into present time for this. And the year, uh, we used to use 1950 as the starting date because that was the year the Dianetics of Modern Science and Mental Health actually in the United States of America became a bestseller. Can you imagine that? A book that L. Ron Hubbard wrote called Dianetics of Modern Science and Mental Health became a bestseller in 1950. And I mean all kinds of people were reading it, even doctors and lawyers and politicians and um, airline pilots and engineers. It mostly appealed not so much to children and youthful people, uh, which has become later when there was more of a cult status, but it was a book written for mature people about the human mind and what you could do to improve it. Yeah. It was one of the original self-help books uh, ever printed and it, it just uh, sold like hotcakes. Anyway, I don't want to go on that too long. Uh, so today, counting 1950 as the beginning of the L. Ron Hubbard movement that encompassed first Dianetics and then Dianetics and Scientology. So, so this is 2012. So it's A.D. after Dianetics, 62. That's the year date, if you want to, 2012. Anyway, soon to be 2013. So, um, yes, and it's, it's a little after morning here in Palo Alto, California. It's rainy, sunny, and cool. Not cold, about 60 degrees. And a uh, beautiful day. And the person that got this whole thing started because I was reluctant, and I withdrew, and she reached, and I withdrew, and I uh, Finally, her persistence, being able to repeat something newly in a new unit of time, like, let's do an interview. So, I finally, realizing that this person could not be denied what she wished, <laughs> I said, okay. So, in her first interview, it was a real interview. It wasn't me giving a lecture. She would ask me questions about myself, about Scientology, about Ron. And she finally got me so much into session that when I realized how great a loss I had had of my idealization of Ron and Dianetics and Scientology, that I cried like a baby. I couldn't stop crying. And it was wonderful. It was a tremendous release of emotion, which is exactly one of the things that Dianetics was all about, was finding out major losses in a person's life and giving them a chance to fully express the grief and the sorrow and also to find any decisions or opinions or things they may have formed during that loss that were now affecting their life adversely. So our very first interview was in truth a marvelous example of a Dianetic session. And Tatiana, who is producer, director, and creator of the series, uh, brought that about. So she's a top-notch auditor because she asked questions that got me looking into my heart. Not literally my biological heart, but the heart of my soul, or me. And I found that I was sitting in the middle, or someone in my world, sitting right in the middle of a giant loss, given that Scientology in particular had become a detested word, a word that I was ashamed of because even countries like Germany were banning Scientology and Scientologists because it so much resembled a totalitarian regime like Adolf Hitler filled with secret police and rules and punishments and terrible things. So anyway, there's a lot of loss there 
for the idealist in my world. And Tatiana helped me gain a great relief release in looking at the thoughts that I had about that loss. Anyway, back to right now, today, present time. One of the things that I wanted to mention right off the bat, if I may, you can't stop me. <laughs> this is from a lecture by L. Ron Hubbard in December of 1952, which he gave in Philadelphia, became known as the Philadelphia Lecture Series. And um, he was talking about Scientology, and I'm just going to read this. Stick with me. It's only a couple of short paragraphs, but it tells something very important about L. Ron Hubbard and his creations like Dianetics Scientology. Okay? If Scientology appears to be incomprehensible for a moment, please do me this favor. Ask yourself, have I got Scientology mixed up in some other body of knowledge? Am I trying to look at Scientology through the eyes of another subject, like psychology or psychoanalysis or something? I'm not asking you to look at this subject, he says, through my eyes. There are two subjects here. One is Scientology, a precise science of universes and the beings therein, or beings who make universes. That's one subject. The other subject is this. Hubbard's opinion, opinions of this subject, and boy, have I got some wild opinions. But that's a different thing. So there's two subjects. There's Dianetics and Scientology. And then there's his opinions about them and a lot of other things. He says here, you can tell very easily when I swing over into my opinions. When I start talking about some field of healing, when I start talking about this or that, it's obvious a big slant and is merely my selection of what he calls randomity or unpredicted behavior. Take it as amusing or evaluate it or throw it away or anything. It has anything really to do with Scientology. I'd like to underline that statement that the opinions of L. Ron Hubbard, you can find them amusing, you can find them disgusting, you can find them pleasant, you can evaluate them any way you want. You can throw them away or anything. But remember, they don't have anything to do with Scientology. Because as the years went by, a lot of his opinions became written in stone and used as though they were the real thing when they weren't. Opinions that I won't get into now, but that things that drove the Church of Scientology and the kids that followed Hubbard to do terrible and stupid things based on opinions that he gave when he was angry, when he was crazy, when he was sleepy, when he was this, when he was that. Opinions that never were Dianetics or Scientology. If you keep that in mind and you make sure that you make it your business to discover the difference between his opinions and those two subjects, you'll be doing yourself and others a great favor. I've spent decades doing the best I could to try to find what are his opinions, really opinions, and what is the real thing. It's not that easy, but I like to imagine that I made some progress in that direction, and that's one of the reasons why I like to do these lectures because sometimes what I say are probably real Dianetics and Scientology. Sometimes what I say are my opinions, get this, about Dianetics and Scientology. I think I try sometimes to indicate when I'm giving my opinions and when I'm talking about the real thing, but it's important in whatever we call these lectures I've been doing, that we differentiate between Phil Spickler, that's my label, 
in Dianetics and Scientology, just as it's important to get the opinions of Hubbard and separate them from Dianetics and Scientology. Thank you for bearing with me in this. Another important thing that Hubbard used to say way back in the beginning, which I think is one of the most important things possible, if what we're trying to do is actually make free people, free to think, free to evaluate, free to choose the people they associate with, the organizations they belong to, free to comment on anything, to criticize anything they want, to give their own opinions. We wanted to make people like that, free to judge for themselves what is true, what isn't true. And so Hubbard used to say, when you're looking at the information of Dianetics and Scientology, the only thing that's true about any of it is what is true for you. That got lost. It was all true, and anything Hubbard said was true. And if you didn't think so, you were in big trouble, just like in any church. If you disagree with its doctrine, its dogma, its large figures, the Pope or the whatever churches, you were in big trouble. You'd go to hell, you'd be excommunicated, you'd be tortured to death. Just a few of the things that might happen to you if you didn't agree with everything that was said by the author church authorities. Well, unfortunately, Church Scientology, which started out as a simple effort to keep um, large organizations from making it impossible for Scientology and Dianetic auditors to work because they, they didn't have credentials in, in mental health and things like that, and they weren't doctors and stuff like that. But by making it a church and making auditors or practitioners ministers, we could do anything without having the state government and the federal government and the AMA and the APA and all these groups say, no, no, you're treading on our territory, you're taking some of our income away, and you're doing things that we don't do and claiming that they're better than putting people in, in isolation in asylums for 20 years and giving them shock treatment and cutting the lobes of their brains off and keeping them in wet sheets and doing all kinds, of, you could do anything to the people that were judged to be mentally incompetent and they had no rights. So Hubbard was fighting for the rights of people not to be, well, two doctors say that this guy is nuts, put him away. He felt in the early days that that was uh, violating the civil rights and liberties of a free, supposedly democratic state. But in the 1950s and even into the 60s, your spouse or a family member and a psychiatrist could go in front of a judge and say he's mentally or she's mentally screwed up and get a thing that would put you away in a mental institution. True, that really was happening in this country. But uh, Hubbard, uh, in his early days, assaulted that, and um, eventually it became that uh, the mental health professionals couldn't do that to you anymore. It was against the law to put someone away that easily and do things to them without their permission. Oh, you don't want shock, we're going to give you shock treatment anyway. We also think that if we go up and drill a couple of holes in your forehead and cut your prefrontal lobes off that you'll behave better. Well, yeah, like a zombie. Or we might do something called a transorbital leucotomy. That's where they take something like a dinner knife and shove it up above your eyeball and into your brain and go that way to separate the frontal, frontal lobes of your brain. Doesn't that sound like good therapy? Or how about 50 shock treatments, the kind that you can die from because it's electroconvulsive shock therapy, which meant it through your whole body 
into tremendous spasms and some people spines fractured and were seriously injured even though six or eight people were holding them down while they were delivering shock treatment. That finally changed and became much more humane. Now they drug you before they give you shock treatment to the point where your body can't convulse but they still give you shock treatment and there are still a few psychiatrists that claim does wonderful things. There may even be a few cases where a little bit of shock treatment, <gasps> forgive me for saying this, <laughs> where a little bit of shock treatment, like a good kick in the ass, might help. I don't know, but that's uh, in the hands of psychiatrists that do these things. The equivalent of, all he needs is a good swift kick in the ass to straighten him out, or a good beating. Well, let's shock the brain. Why, why not stop kicking his ass? Kick him in the brain. Ah. So now it's um, what are called psychotropic drugs. And some of them are temporarily effective, but the long term of taking these drugs can uh, truly affect physical health enormously. And they never find out really what it is that's got the person screwed up. Anyway, I'm off topic here, probably <laughs> ranting and raving about something. But the main thing is we've got to separate opinions from facts. Opinions are grand. Everybody can have them. Um, I believe that everybody should have the same opinions that I do, which if you're a powerful dictator like Hubbard became, is a very dangerous thing. We actually want people that have a lot of different opinions, even though it makes the society and things cease to be rock solid, fixed in stone, it's healthy. That's what we expect from artists and writers and poets and people of vision, is that they won't have the same gosh darn opinions over and over and over again. You know, you can die from boredom when you get into a society, a totalitarian society, where it's wrong to voice opinions that are not exactly what the chief says. I take a small drink of caffeinated tea. Green tea.